Today's panel anticipates the future growth and globalization among all leading universities in the world. It's, it is the times have certainly changed. And uh, I know in my own career, uh, early on, I didn't have nearly as much of an opportunity to meet with the heads of universities from around the world. But yeah, today's reality is that we actually have regular meetings um, every year with the heads of universities from China, India, um, countries in Latin America, Africa, and so forth. And it's, it's a completely different reality. Of course, over the last several years, Brown has devoted significant energy to strengthening and growing the international components of its educational research service and outreach programs. In keeping with Brown's longstanding commitment to public service, social responsibility, our efforts have focused on the preparation of students for lives and careers as responsible global citizens, while at the same time emphasizing the importance of scholarship that advances the well-being of people around the world. In the latter regard, we actively promote a deeper understanding of the diversity of the world's cultures, and we facilitate more and more through our policies and funding opportunities for students, staff, and faculty uh, ways of finding meaningful engagement with those cultures as a means of enhancing our teaching and research mission. Of course, the internationalization imperative has been around for a very long time. In fact, as long as formal learning has existed. Scholars in ancient times overcame extraordinary barriers to share knowledge and become familiar with different modes of thought. More recently, these barriers have come down as travel and technology have made global society more willfully open with abundant opportunities to collaborate across nations and cultures. The degree to which cultures and economies are intertwined, of course, is manifest today. While we can't anticipate fully the educational consequence of the global shocks in the wake of the banking crisis, we certainly understand that the interdependence that remained a largely academic point for so long is now top of mind for general populations. In that sense, things will never be quite the same again. So what do we do with this new level of recognition of the impact of globalization and internationalizations? Will we utilize this openness and connection to explore new ideas and collectively advance progress? The open access trend among institutions of higher education is a sure sign that some are not only hopeful for that reality, but are willing to forego some benefits to accelerate that progress. This makes more meaningful than ever the idea that our learning community is not merely our campuses, but the world. It's interesting to ponder whether this imperative today will upend the current hierarchy of universities worldwide, whether it will redefine the content and requirements of higher education around the world, or whether the trends that we see today will take yet more decades to unfold and establish themselves solidly across the breadth of institutions worldwide. And is it even desirable for this greater uniformity and linkage to take hold and reshape our institutions of higher education? Leading off the discussion this, uh, this afternoon is Professor Andrew Yao, a very distinguished computer scientist who currently is the director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Information Sciences at Tsinghua University. Before um, becoming director there, he taught at MIT, Berkeley, and Princeton. I think I do recall uh, the moment that you were wooed away uh, to uh, Tsinghua, uh, the distress at Princeton about um, what was happening. And it was that moment, I remember the debate there, that, oh my goodness, what is happening to our universities? Now will international scholars be wooed away to return to um, other countries uh, on faculties. And this was a, I don't know if you were aware of that at the time, but this is a big buzz at Princeton. So good for you. <laughs> Professor Yao <laughs> is joined by Brown's Vice President for International Affairs, Matt Gutman, Professor Franco Preparaja, and Professor Lingzhen Wang. They all have had significant, significant university experiences on both sides of the Pacific. Professor Gutman is Vice President for International Affairs and Professor of Anthropology at Brown. He has an international reputation in the fields of democracy and social change, poverty, inequality and development, health and gender. Most of his ethnographic research has been conducted in Mexico. Professor Franco Preparata received a doctorate from the University of Rome. In 1991, he moved from Illinois to Brown University to become the Anne Wang Professor of Computer Science. 
He is an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow, and a fellow of the Japan Society for the Advancement of Science. He's mentored many leaders of computer sciences in Asia. He's visited universities in Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, and elsewhere. Professor Ling Jin Wang of East Asian Studies has her BA and MA from Nanjing University in China. She came to the United States as a visiting fellow at Harvard University and earned her PhD in East Asian literature from Cornell University. She joined the Department of East Asian Studies at Brown in 1998. Her efforts in establishing the connection between Nanjing and Brown in gender studies has played a crucial role in formalizing a Brown-Nanjing Accord, which will be signed next week with the visit of the Chancellor of Nanjing to Brown. Welcome all, and now we will ask each of our panelists to offer their perspectives on the topic today, Globaliz globalization today, some perspectives from Asian universities. We'll ask each, each of them to take about five uh, to seven minutes, uh, and then uh, we will open it up to discussion uh, following uh, that. Thank you very much. Um, and in terms of order, uh, I think Professor Ya will Uh, President Siemens, my fellow panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, return to Brown after uh, 30 plus years. And I've, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, see many of my old colleagues that are still here. By old, I mean uh, <laughs> not, not in the... Uh, <laughs> old, you mean exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, perhaps, uh, uh, let me just... Uh, <laughs> Uh, start out by uh, uh, telling uh, a bit about myself and how uh, am I connected with globalization. <laughs> uh, I was born in uh, Shanghai, China and uh, went to uh, Taiwan at a very early age and grew up there. And after finishing the uh, bachelor's degree there, I uh, came to the U.S. Uh, for graduate study and, and so uh, and then I spent the next uh, 35 years uh, in the United States just teaching in various places. And uh, in 2004, uh, I was contacted by Tsinghua University. And, and uh, uh, in, uh, at that time, uh, Tsinghua University and uh, several other leading universities in China, they started, uh, thought about the urgency of transforming some of the leading universities in China to uh, uh, become uh, internationally level uh, uh, research universities. And now, if you think about the, uh, uh, the history of the developments of universities in China, uh, uh, there were some, uh, just look at the, the last uh, 30 odd years, since 1980, uh, uh, China started to uh, rebuild their higher educational system. And uh, uh, now, for the first 30, kind of 25 years, uh, the efforts were simply to get back to a level where the uh, professors in the Chinese university to be able to have a level of conversation with their Western uh, counterparts because of the decades of neglect in that area. And uh, uh, during that period, actually, it's a pretty impressive achievement because uh, about 30 years ago that uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese professors in science and technology, they wouldn't really un kind of even uh, understand what the problem, uh, the scientific problem were uh, uh, at those, those times. But uh, now if you look at uh, 20 some years later, uh, they have caught up to a point where they, they, they certainly could uh, converse with their Western counterparts, uh, if not at the uh, uh, research results level, but certainly uh, at the level to where they can communicate and, and uh, understand the problems. And now, uh, the, uh, what about the next stage? I think that's the question that the, uh, uh, the Chinese leaders whether in government or in universities uh, were thinking about. And I think that uh, they have decided that uh, the only way that China can, can keep the uh, miraculous economic growth for the, for the last three dec decades is to elevate 
their uh, technology and scientific contents in their, in their uh, economic activities. And that necessarily uh, 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 means that they have to have uh, uh, state-of-the-art research universities that, that would continue to prepare the economy uh, so that they can produce intellectual properties uh, and, and high margin products and so on. So it's against that, that background that if you look at the, uh, the political agenda of this, the Chinese government, uh, let's say for the next five years, I mean, they all think in terms of five years cycles that the development of science and technology uh, is very high on the political agenda. And I think that's, that's pretty uh, 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 rare in, 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 in the world to, to push the scientists to such uh, high visibility uh, in, on the national agenda. And I think certainly as a scientist, I welcome that. And I also, I, I, I think that they, 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 they are very, very wise in making this decision. And uh, uh, so uh, at 19, in, 19, in 2004, that, uh, 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 the, the Chinese university already were starting to think about uh, elevating their, 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 uh, their, uh, their, their research levels and to build first-rate research universities. And I, I thought that was a very exciting prospect. And uh, that's how I decided to uh, uh, return to China to, uh, 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 to make my contributions because I think that I, I, I do have something to uh, contribute uh, in this. I think it's a, it, it, it's a very uh, 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 rare opportunity for, for someone to make contributions here. And, and uh, now, seven and a half years later, and um, I think that um, if I look back, that uh, there were times of frustration, uh, but overall, when you think about it, I think that, uh, that China today offers a very large canvas uh, for, for uh, uh, people who want to, uh, to, uh, 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 st to make a career there uh, at whatever level uh, 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 that is. And, uh, and, and I, I think that, that when I think about the past seven and a half years, uh, uh, what's most satisfying is that I found that the, the atmosphere uh, for uh, reformation in, 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 in higher education, uh, uh, the, I think that the, the dialogue has changed. I think seven and a half years ago, the, uh, the uh, topic was whether we should uh, uh, try to uh, to some degree, adopt the the uh, the uh, uh, international way of uh, running a research university. Whether that was the right thing to do, I think seven and a half years ago, uh, it was not really decided among the rank and file uh, 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 in, ch in, in in universities. But now, I think there's no there's a consensus that this is the way that that the uh, uh, Chinese universities, at least the, the leading ones, uh, they have to, uh, to a great degree, uh, to to uh, uh, adopt a similar uh, methods of evaluation and the and, and also the various university regulations, and and so um, so I think that the the interesting and exciting period has just become when I look at. Uh, the situation today, uh, perhaps I can, I can, I can single out a first, first a few points. Uh, firstly, uh, Chinese universities uh, uh, is, is a very, is a vast system with really hundreds, uh, and probably it's, it's a system uh, as large, uh, perhaps larger than the U.S. system. So uh, I think that when one moves ahead, uh, it's, it's not that every university is going to move at the same 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 pace, uh, but uh, I think that the leading edge of the universities they are going to move at a very fast pace in the next five to ten years, and I I really believe that in ten years we are going to see uh, 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 some university will will join the elite uh, the rank of elite universities uh, internationally, and. Uh, uh, the second point I want to make is that uh, uh, the reason that I, 
I feel some confidence that this is going to happen is that uh, when I look at the university that, that I am at, namely Tsinghua University, I think that, that, that actually all the, all the uh, pieces are, are, are in place. I think that, that, uh, that uh, uh, in particular, uh, many parts of the universities now are starting to, to have a tenure track system of professors. And I think that's a big change because previously, basically, if you enter the system, then you uh, 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 kind of you have a job for life. But now it's going to, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the merit system is going to kick in. And, um, uh, and also, uh, when you look at the status of the, uni the state of the, the Tsinghua University now, that there are many uh, very competent, uh, 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 many internationally well-known scholars uh, that are put at the helm of their indiv individual departments and uh, schools. And, uh, and furthermore, I think that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the budget problem is, uh, uh, I think that, uh, that for the de 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 property development of the institutes and the schools are in place. So I think that all the, all the objective uh, uh, prerequisites are in place. And uh, uh, this will create, in my opinion, a uh, uh, virtuous cycle of competition, uh, even within the same university. For example, I am the head of an uh, uh, institute uh, related to uh, computer science. And uh, when I think about uh, uh, how to develop our institute, I want to make sure that I'm not left behind compared to my to my, to my friends in the uh, School of Biological Sciences or in the School of, uh, of Science and so on. So I think that, 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 that in other words, I think that the, if you put Tsinghua University right now uh, in the United States, say next to Brown University, at least some, a, a, say 30% 30, 30 of the university would look not too much different from Brown University. So therefore, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the, 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 the the uh, uh, prognosis is good for uh, what's going to happen forward. And uh, so uh, I believe that my experience in the past seven and a half years, uh, 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 I think it's a, it's a very enriching experience to be able to, to, uh, uh, to witness a, a, a uh, a, a, a very exciting time in the higher education development in China for the next stage. And, and I think that at, at the end of the tunnel of this period will be a China, uh, a Chinese higher education, at least at the, at, at the leading edge, it will be uh, uh, very much uh, uh, similar to the uh, system in the, in, the, in the United States. And I think that's all for the good because I, 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 I believe that even though globalization, uh, it's, it's, it's a very complex issue. I think that uh, uh, if you look at the social, the economic, and the various, various issue, uh, aspect, uh, it's not entirely uh, uh, something all for the positive. However, in terms of higher education and uh, in terms of the development of science, I think this is amazing, amazingly great uh, uh, step forward for all of us globally, because I think that that when the, uh, when when Asia and China and India uh, that can uh, uh, actually uh, make their human resources to contribute at a much higher efficiency uh, 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 level uh, to the to the development and the progress of science. I think that uh, it will make the progress of science, uh, I think, uh, uh, much, ex much more exciting and uh, uh, productive. And uh, I think in that spirit, I think uh, 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 the globalization of universities in, in China uh, is going to be uh, 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 something that, 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 that we, we uh, will all benefit from. And, and I think that I'll stop at this point. Thank you.
one of the uh, things that um, I'm happiest about to be here today is the fact that I spent a great deal of time as an undergraduate learning uh, Chinese and I didn't do anything with it afterwards, but now I'm able to participate with many of you in this room um, and distinguished guests and help to build China studies here at, at Brown. Um, I think one of the most important points that I take from, from Dr. Yao's remarks and, and, and I think really bears emphasis is that uh, the model of we at Brown or we in the United States have much to teach the world certainly still exists, but increasingly there is also, as part of that, we have much to learn from the world. And so that we have top scientists and scholars in many parts of the world, um, and that it is important for our top scholars and scientists to be working and collaborating with them, but also for our students uh, to be going abroad and to study with uh, the best in the world. I think at Brown we're faced with a once in a lifetime opportunity right now, a chance to develop key partnerships with select Chinese universities in science, technology, humanities, and the social sciences. And I think the next two decades are really going to be critical. Uh, these opportunities are truly historic uh, and really uh, enormous. Brown, um, like uh, any uh, leading university, seeks to attract the best from around the world. Last year we had 800 applications uh, from uh, the People's Republic of China alone and 21 students uh, entered the first year class this year, the largest from any country, uh, the largest number of students from any country outside the US. Brown seeks to build the richest, uh, the most abundant and varied opportunities for students uh, and faculty to engage uh, with uh, our foreign colleagues and, and institutions. And uh, just in the last uh, two years in China, we have expanded environmental studies collaborations with Peking University. We've established a global forum with Nanjing University and uh, built on uh, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the ties in terms of gender studies in particular, um, as well as other areas. Um, Brown is not, as some might think, going global. Brown is global and has been for quite a while. But what it means today, I think, is an intensification. Uh, and under President Simmons' leadership, um, what internationalization means and breaking down the notion of there's the national and there's the international, and it becomes educational, uh, regardless of where it is and where it takes place. And opportunities uh, will exist uh, both to send our students and faculty abroad as well as bring more people to Brown itself. In 1995, China launched what they call the 211 Project to develop 100 universities. 1998, there was something called the 985, the 985 Project to develop 39 selected universities, and within that, nine world-class universities. Uh, some people, I don't know, at least outside China, they call them the, the Chinese Ivy League. I don't know whether that's a, a term that's actually used in China itself. Um, and Brown's very proud to be working with several of these, including Tsinghua, uh, Peking University, Zhejiang University, and Nanjing University. One of the interesting things that's going on is that 160,000 students from China are today studying in the United States. This is the largest number of students, about 22% of all international students. At the same time, China has launched a major effort to bring in half a million students from other parts of the world to study in China. And it seems to me that both things happen simultaneously. People are learning and teaching in different kinds of environments. Uh, just as no one in China today, it seems to me, should graduate uh, from college without knowing something about the history, culture, society, uh, and even language of the United States, similarly, uh, that shouldn't happen at Brown, that you can graduate without knowing something about China in all these ways. And I think the year of China has been really important um, in helping to catalyze some of the efforts already underway and really launch some new ones. And um, this, uh, this is really critical. So uh, in the future, I think uh, some of the things we're looking at uh, with respect to uh, China in particular are developing more joint programs, both research and teaching, uh, training programs. Uh, we already have training programs, for instance, in education. Um, I just met with somebody from Tsinghua about two weeks ago, and they're very interested in developing training programs in uh, schools of public health 
Um, and there are many other areas like this. Uh, and I think that this is what it means to be a global university today. Um, it means reaching out to the best uh, wherever they might be and finding ways, as I say, uh, uh, for shared learning and teaching uh, and finding <coughs> mutual benefit uh, in these exchanges and collaborations. Thanks. Well, I mean, from the title of uh, this panel, that is the perspective from Asian universities, certainly nobody here has the same uh, vintage point that the Dr. Yao has. I mean, he is viewing that from the inside, and instead we can only be outside observers in any case. So just to establish, though, what my modest credentials are in this area, I will just mention that I've spent uh, eight summers in the last 10 years at the National University of Singapore on a, on a visiting chair. And so, I mean, I've been able then to observe exactly how the situation, how, I mean, what is the fabric of uh, the Singaporean higher education system, and also what are their connection with their neighbors, and especially with their neighbors, uh, their big neighbors is China. And, uh, well, then certainly globalization is uh, an incredible socio-economic phenomenon that is being driven mostly today. We are becoming aware of it because of uh, the facility of the ease of communication. And ease of communication obviously is uh, driven by engineering and science. I mean, it must be said very clearly. I don't want to give here any streak of two cultures contrast because I don't like that. But certainly, I mean, so, I, I, I mean, science has been, uh, the incredible progress of science is exactly, and of uh, technology is really what has made globalization something that we're all aware of today. And we talked about it. So it is very natural that in, the, in these stages in which we are now, I mean, globalization impacts mostly the scientific aspect of higher education. Um, I mean, uh, the more uh, uh, humanistic aspect will be impacted too, but they are more local. They are more, I mean, uh, they don't have the universality that definitely engineering and science has. Engineering and science, uh, in principle, should speak no language. Today they speak English because that is becoming the Latin of modern society. We have to face that. And uh, this is a transformational force. I mean, globalization forces all of the other partners just to find what is the best way to do that. They're all striving and collaborating in building what is an educational model. And it must be said also in a kind of nationalistic way that um, the American model is maybe the best model that we have around. It must be said very clearly we have uh, an educational, a higher educational system, I don't want to talk about the K, K to 12, that's another issue. The higher education system is something in which if you really want to improve something, you really have to strive to find something that you want to improve. And uh, what are, in my opinion, the most uh, distinguishing feature that make the American model so outstanding? Well, that's the fact that uh, differently from what happened in other places. People in a department have total academic freedom. There is rank hierarchy, but the rank hierarchy is more to give a recognition of achievement through scholarship and also to capitalize on the collective wisdom that is acquired over the years. But any junior faculty in any American university has basically the same academic freedom as any senior faculty, which is something that, for example, was unheard of in Europe and most likely even in China or in other Asian universities that were more modeled on the European British model in which there were a leading personality and all of the others were just uh, disciples in some sense. American universities have no disciple system. And that is something that people are recognizing as being one of the great strengths of our system. And another strength, and that is a less popular thing to be stated, is our nine-month academic year arrangement. The nine months 
arrangement, if coupled with this satisfactory funding landscape, is exactly what stimulates individual entrepreneurship. And although many things that have been proposed don't pan out, from a lot of proposal, a lot of good science emerges. And that is also what has propelled American University in the last half century after Vannevar Bush established this funding model and American University followed on the nine months appointment. And this is something, for example, that uh, of course, I mean, in summation university is being recognized as being a great driving force, but is something that has the obvious social reluctance to being accepted. I mean, to be paid only for nine months and to look for extra compensation in the other three months is not something that is very attractive. But it is the strength of our universities. We have to face that. And so, in all of the university, although the transition is not finished, what I have observed, and of course it's very hard to generalize in this thing, but what I have observed is that there is a transition from the British model to the American model. There is a very definite transition, and this transition is saluted as really a great step forward. And it is exactly what enables then uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship among the young people. The young people have really, uh, are really the driving force now of all of the Asian universities that I've visited. For example, there could be many other things that would correspond to the, that would uh, uh, exemplify the integration of the systems between the United States and all of these other partners, okay? Uh, one of them, uh, for example, which is small, is uh, not the notion of the, well, we have been talking for some time with the notion of joint degrees. Joint degrees are a very hard thing uh, because every institution is very jealous of its own degrees. They are not willing to share the name of their own degrees with any other institution. It's a kind of trademark, so to speak. But one device that we have found uh, that is working now is what we have called the concurrent degree. What is the concurrent degree? Well, the concurrent degree is then two institutions get, get together and they establish a two-step degree, for example, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science, in which one institution grants one with its own name, and the other institution grants the other with its own name. But the students are jointly selected by joint committees of faculty coming from both universities. And we have one in place, two in place, two such degrees, in place now here at Brown with the National University of Singapore just to quote an example. Uh, to conclude, I mean, I see more and more stronger research emerging from China. Uh, the names of people in a very, um, authors of, of article in very reputable journals, there are many more Asian names today than there were 10, 15 years ago. I mean, as, uh, as Dr. Yao pointed out, I mean, China lost one generation, and they are building very fast. And uh, what they have now is that their strength is basically young people that are in their most productive years. Evaluation criteria? I think that the evaluation criteria that we have will become the evaluation criteria of the global world. And I think that I will start here. Hello, hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Professor Chong Yi Tan for inviting me here. I think the probably reason behind this invitation, I think I'm the only uh, person doing the humanities here. So uh, I will carry on the sense of duty and say something different about uh, <laughs> globalization, mostly from you know, uh, faculty members or people in the humanities. Um, I think, you know, although people have different takes on um, uh, globalization, um, but, you know, in a more fundamental uh, term, globalization refers to a process uh, that reconfigures the world by the rule of the market, right? Um, globalization is a process that has been driven by international trade and further 
aided by uh, information and communication uh, 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 technology. Um, so uh, even though globalization is not something new, but people argue that uh, it has entered a new phase uh, since 1990s when neoliberalism uh, became the, uh, the world's you know, dominant economic uh, paradigm. Um, so in higher education um, um, in general, uh, globalization has been viewed um, very often as a double-edged sword. Um, uh, on the one hand, of course, it provides all the uh, international communications, unprecedented international communications, uh, collaborations, uh, um, and also it helps really the development in uh, science and technology as all the you know, previous panelists have uh, emphasized. Uh, it also has, you know, promoted uh, ec economic growth. But at the same time, right, um, it also kind of um, uh, uh, changes the stratification of disciplines uh, between arts and science. Um, it has also remapped, I would say, the academic, you know, disciplines um, um, uh, in economic terms, uh, uh, giving, you know, top priority to those disciplines that can be directly linked to the market, uh, the economy, while marginalizing right, other, you know, other disciplines uh, that do not really uh, translate uh, uh, to substantial uh, profits. Um, so there, this is, the, I think, the, uh, the concerns people in the, in the humanities um, um, uh, have these days. And in addition to this, you know, new hierarchical, you know, uh, 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 arrangement of disciplines, uh, there's some common features, uh, uh, such as, you know, standardization, uh, homogenization, and the, you know, the, uh, um, um, uh, the expansion, for example, of applied and professional um, uh, uh, subjects, uh, the reduction of, you know, uh, government funding. Right, and then the, the the private sector as a, a key player in high education. I mean, all these um, uh, features uh, argued by some scholars in the humanities uh, have, in, in in a way or another, uh, posed you know certain uh, uh, risks to uh, especially uh, the humanities. Uh, having said all this, um, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, um, uh, high, high education uh, can be developed uh, in separation from economic uh, terms or means. I think rather the question for us to think uh, 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 is uh, how exactly in today's this new phase of globalization, how can we maintain um, high education, the university, uh, or probably further develop you know, the university as a place that you know, critical thinking, independent thinking can be developed as a place that more integrated uh, 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 education can be provided, and as a place that a broader, more broader social uh, uh, issues and concerns can be you know reflected and uh, and, and and discussed. Okay, um, I think despite the uh, very general uh, utilitarian orientation of globalization. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, globalization is not a unified and a fixed process. Uh, so in the process, it really creates a lot of uh, uh, new spaces and opportunities. Um, so in the area of higher education, we have already witnessed how transnational, as you know, Professor Simon mentioned, how transnational communications have really bring uh, universities uh, of the world together, uh, discussing and addressing issues about the role and the status of, uh, of the university uh, in today's globalized world and in the future. Um, and also many opportunities Many opportunities have also become available at the local level in countries like China, uh, where uh, globalization has gone hand in hand with uh, uh, decentralization. Uh, so consequently, 
um, I would argue that uh, uh, many universities in China, especially regional universities in China, they now become more and more active uh, uh, in terms of uh, envisioning um, the function of university in China and in terms of um, uh, setting academ academic agenda uh, in China. And here at Brown, we know that uh, Brown's uh, internationalization campaign has uh, more concretely linked around to the world beyond Europe, uh, particularly Asia and Latin America. And Brown faculty members have taken the opportunity and helped you know, establish many uh, transnational uh, collaborative programs. And personally, I've been uh, involved in the development of the Nanjing Brown Joint Program in Gender Studies and the Humanities. Uh, uh, I strongly believe that active engagement uh, is key to negotiating with and influencing uh, the process of globalization in higher education today. Um, finally, just a quick note that um, uh, uh, the Nanjing director of the joint program in gender studies and the humanities, Professor uh, Chen Zhou He, just arrived at Brown yesterday to participate in activities organized by the Office of International Affairs and uh, Yale of China. And he's now in the audience um, uh, right now. <laughs> and so if you have any questions about you know, the joint program, uh, we both are very happy to answer them. Thank you. Great. Well, that was certainly uh, very stimulating. And I was happy to see that uh, uh, we didn't have complete agreement on the panel uh, about <laughs> something. So, um, uh, I, I want to really uh, zero in on that in particular and see if we can get some discussion going among you. Um, <laughs> not too culture. <laughs> not too. <laughs> um, I was very interested in, um, in the take um, of Professor Preparata that, quote, humanities do not have the universality of science and engineering. <laughs> um, I, I would say that was. Well, I, I should have qualified. <laughs> well, it's no fun if you qualify it. So, so we'll give you a chance to do that in your in your response. Um, and uh, and of course, um, uh, the one question really is um, what 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 is the role of um, the uh, universe of disciplines in higher education in this whole process? And we had, of course, uh, a view into computer science. Um, and, um, uh, and, and now we've heard about humanities, but we've got a whole range of disciplines here uh, in, uh, in university life. And it would be wonderful to tease that out a bit more and to hear, for example, at Chinua, which is, you were very modest, I have to say, overly modest. Uh, Chinua is one of the great universities of the world, and everybody knows that. So the fact that, um, that you um, think that 30% of Chinua would be similar to Brown, I, I don't know many people who would agree with that, frankly. Uh, so we very much look up to uh, Chinua internationally. Um, I also go back to the comments um, uh, that Professor Wang made, um, preserving the place of critical thinking, um, uh, and then pointing to the more, quote, utilitarian aspect of globalization. So I think we've got some counterpoints here that are very interesting to explore. Um, uh, Professor Wang seemed to suggest uh, the double-edged sword nature of globalization in regard to uh, the diminution, perhaps, uh, a perceived diminution of some uh, disciplines in the process. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that to be so? Um, and uh, if you do not, why, why don't you concur with that? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, insofar as standardization and homogenation uh, seem to be a negative um, uh, perspective for some, um, and yet I think from what I'm sensing from, um, from some of you at least is that this is a good thing because it has brought China along, for example, to raise the quality of its higher education uh, system. Uh, and uh, that standardization has been very important in moving the system in China. And yet here, uh, Professor Wang is saying it's been somewhat damaging um, in the, uh, from her perspective in uh, elevating some disciplines and diminishing others. So, um, we'd like to have some exchange on that. 
What think you have of <laughs> qualification? I, like, I am okay. the one that should defend. Uh, uh, <laughs> please, feel free. Okay, no, no. Actually, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into any discussion about the two cultures because I feel myself <laughs> as a humanist at heart. So, but what I say is that, uh, for example, uh, the study of uh, some specific discipline, like Chinese history, is more likely to be more intensely studied in China than to be studied in different places. Whereas uh, the science uh, that is being shared among this university has already, although I mean, I am not, the, I'm not excluding the fact that we are slowly going towards a very, to a broader notion of historical awareness. <laughs> but traditionally, I mean, history awareness has been very local, has been very local. For example, I, I remember in my, in, my, uh, in my early studies, in my green years, uh, we were incredibly Eurocentric. We didn't think that there was anything beyond the Middle East. I mean, Indian China were mentioned only by name. Well, today that is no longer feasible, but it will take longer before the global the, or the local mentality would accept this global view. Whereas in the science, this happens instantly. So in that sense, I was a kind of curtly say something of this kind. I mean, I don't mean mm -hmm. by any way to diminish the universality of humanities. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, about the uniformization of the of standards, I think that um, the American system has been tremendously uh, productive in terms of producing uh, 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 scientists and engineers of extraordinary uh, high creativity and originality, and I think from that perspective, uh, it seems to be to be. Uh, uh, not very pragmatic to try to reinvent the wheel because I think that uh, we have to we have to uh, uh, take lessons from the American experience uh, and and uh, uh, proceed on that basis and I think that's why that um, that uh, today in China and actually for the last thirty years that the um, American ideal of having a general liberal education have large universities uh, have become adopted in China because previously, the uh, for a time the the view is the Soviet model, where you each university has a very uh, focus either on engineering or on science or in and 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 so. Uh, in that uh, sense, would you say that the. Um, uh, humanities and social sciences and the arts have become yeah. more uh, more strongly supported in yeah. Chinese universities. Yeah, I think I think today that in Tsinghua University, it's uh, uh, put emphasis in all areas, including humanities, and uh, and and uh, uh, so I think that it it uh, from that perspective, a, a emulation of some of the spirits of the American universities actually it strengthens strengthens all fields. Um, I think that uh, so. Uh, uh, of, I mean, I, I cannot speak for the the humanities in in uh, with any pretense of having expertise. But uh, let me just make one remark, namely that that um, that I, I agree with Lyndon that that you know globalization is very complex, and especially when you enter into the social and the cultural domains, that um, the 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 modern efficiency of communication uh, has a, a, a possible effect of decimating some of the kind of the uniqueness of, of, of local cultures in different parts of the world. And now, uh, whether we like it or not, this seems to be, to be something that is happening and, and I don't think there's any way that you can, you can, you can prevent it. I think that, I mean, for example, if you look at the young people in China, and I think their taste in terms of entertainment and the music is not too much different from the American youth. And uh, now, this would be unthinkable 100 years ago. But, uh, but now, I think there's no, uh, there's no way that you can, uh, if you want to have a liberal world where, 
where communication is as free as possible, this is an inevitable uh, 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 consequence. Uh, uh, so uh, I think it's not, it's not something that we really need to worry about. I think that uh, after all, I think we are facing, uh, at, at least from a scientist view, I think that I, I'm, I'm sure that I, I need to qualify it because I think that, <laughs> that, 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 that I think from the perspective of diversity and so on, maybe it's not the, the best of, of, of possible outcomes. But uh, from my perspective, I think that we are facing something more serious in the world than worrying about the, uh, the question of uh, whether the, uh, uh, the, the taste of the youth in all parts of the world are converging to the Hollywood uh, sense. I, 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 I think that's something that I don't worry as much. I think I, think I, I, I would worry, uh, at least from the scientist perspective, I would worry m more about whether science can solve the hunger problem, can solve the environmental problem. And uh, uh, I, uh, so I think that, uh, 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 that, that, I mean, everyone is limited in one's own way. So I, I, uh, so from my perspective, I think globalization is a great positive force because that uh, it frees uh, all human beings in the world to develop their potential to make science work for uh, the uh, uh, survival of the, of, of the, mm -hmm. of but the planet. Pr yeah. Professor Gudman, would you, would you say that uh, though, uh, going back to Professor Wang, that, that, that globalization is mediated appropriately in order to achieve, to um, forestall some of the negative uh, potential of globalization? I think this is part of the debate. Um, Thomas Friedman, the columnist for the New York Times, famously wrote that the world is flat. And he said, well, I don't really mean it, but it's an, it's an exaggerated way to talk about something that is happening. And I think that's fine, but the fact is there are, as you just pointed to, tremendous problems and challenges and inequalities in the world. And I think that the notion that we all know the same things or we are all after the same things, our goals are the same, even in the sciences, it seems to me, you're going to have tremendous debate over what should get funded and what doesn't get funded. Oh, sure. And there may be tremendous differences from one place to another, uh, both internally within a country, but from one country to another. And it's going to have to do with many factors, including politics. Uh, and it seems to me that globalization can't be dealt with apart from uh, the political, because it's not just simply we live in, in the same world. And I, I think this is maybe partly what, what um, Professor Wong was talking about. Um, I do think that the debates that take place around climate change, uh, around infectious disease and how to solve this from one place to another can be tremendously beneficial. It seems to me if we're talking about what China calls medium-sized cities, which means like five million people, mm -hmm. that's a medium-sized city. <laughs> I, I um, thought it was 10. So up to 10. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, if you're talking about global governance and you're talking about urban transportation and you're talking about pollution and all these kinds of things, and now I'm speaking as the social scientist on the panel, um, it, you benefit. If you're in uh, Chengdu, you benefit by talking to people in uh, Sao Paulo and finding out what they have discovered, what they're trying to do, um, and what are the debates and how they've been resolving them. So I think that communication is not new either, even in China. After all, the May 4th movement in 1919 was all about what was going on in the rest of the world um, and how China would participate or not. And uh, the tremendous growth of interest in um, everything from, um, I have a graduate student who's studying yoga in Mexico City and why 12,000 people go on the main square there to practice yoga together. Um, and what does this have to do in terms of Mexican culture and whatnot? Uh, it seems to me this kind of thing has been going on for centuries, if not millennia. But what's new is the rapid rate yeah. of exchange and, what's, sure. and, and change. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if we make mistakes, they can be really tremendously costly, costly. Uh, such as climate change, for instance. So, At the same Wong. time, uh, Professor Wang, uh, uh, it, the, one of the challenges that each of these um, countries has to meet 
is holding the country together. China has um, uh, a, an immensely diverse population um, and has, in many ways, um, similar um, struggles um, that we've seen um, in this country. Uh, and the idea of how um, all of those peoples within China over time will be elect to be uh, positive contributors to the central goals of the country is, is something that, that the country has to worry about. So in that regard, coming back to um, uh, questions that you have raised, um, don't the humanities and the arts have an extraordinarily important role to play in forging those connections, in edifying uh, populations about what those connections are, the high points, the low points, uh, the critical thinking that you, that you talk about. So why, how can we get scientists uh, and others to see, um, and policymakers to see the value of bringing those things into play? Uh, this is a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see uh, whether I can address just a small part of it. But you know, Chinese, uh, China has a very interesting tradition for thousands of years until 1970s. China, in general, is very in favor of culture, or super, uh, 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 super structural elements in their you know, education. Uh, uh, in traditional China, we know the, the ruling elite, right? The translation is very good, the literati, very often translated as um, scholar official, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so those people who study hard, you know, memorizing all the literary cultural texts, the people who are able to write, they are going to rule the country, okay? And this has lasted for thousands of years, right? And then, you know, during the modern era when China first confronted the West, right? Um, and then the, the whole nation has the debate about whether, you know, Western te technology should be viewed as just a tool, right? While Chinese culture as the essence, that's a very famous, you know, famous discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, even during the communist uh, uh, era, I think culture, Remember, we have the May 4th culture movement, and then we have the proletarian culture movement. Um, I think the, the, the emphasis is still on culture. And then scholar are, uh, most, uh, many scholars argue it's not until Deng Xiaoping's era, uh, who introduced the market economy to China, that has finally de demolished, in a way, the traditional way of viewing the world. However, there is still strong, I would say, residue, legacy from the tradition. And that's why I think, as Professor Yao said, people in China still recognize higher education as a public cause, even though with the very rapid privatization going on, globalization at the same time. So I do see China, from the perspective of humanities, are uh, still hopeful, very much. Mm -hmm. Think about the state still play the most important role in fun you know, uh, 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 providing funding for the key, all the key important uh, universities. Um, and there, I mean, I'm, sometimes I feel very envious of my colleagues in China now, in the humanities. Uh, they are more than adequately funded, yes. right? And that's something we really lack here, right? Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. But then, you know, in 1980s, right, it's Deng Xiaoping who first tie high, high education to China's so-called four modernizations, right? So the, for the first time, high education in China has been kind of redefined, right? So then you have all this, you know, and then that goes hand in hand. It's the late 1970s, early 1980s, where, you know, the, the so-called neoliberalism as political practice also emerged in the world mm -hmm. from the United States and, you know, Great Britain, you know. Uh, uh, so you do see China at that point, you know, joined, you know, the, the world in, in many ways. Um, but I would argue, I mean, even scholars now in China, I recently read an article by a scholar, you know, uh, uh, analyzing higher education in China. And then this scholar uh, uh, said that the, the central issue in China is how to integrate the so-called collective values, uh, the China's traditional fine tradition with uh, the so-called, you know, uh, educating students to become independent mind. I, so I, I do uh, see that, you know, in the United States and in China, uh, scholars uh, or educators in general, uh, they have in fact come to certain consensus about the value of the humanities and its role in not just higher education 
and probably, you know, uh, in terms of uh, 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 thinking about the, the world future in, in general. Mm -hmm. So in that way, I think uh, uh, I really appreciate today's, you know, opportunity uh, 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 communicating, especially with uh, scientists. Um, I do see the value of science. I think. <laughs> I think scientists should uh, <laughs> also see the value, I would say, which is more fundamental to human world, right? Um, now very much embodied, you know, in the humanities, right? Um, and the other thing, the last point uh, uh, I want to uh, mention is that uh, um, uh, I think the worry I sometimes uh, have felt is that this new liberal uh, globalization um, as this massive, you know, uh, process um, um, that, you know, ties everything to the value of the market uh, itself really worrisome. Um, that's some, you know, my more, pass you know, pessimistic view of the whole thing. Um, and the things that, you know, all the governments now, they are they're into the policies, right, it's all in for this kind of, uh, 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 this connection, everything tied to the market. Um, but uh, at the same time, I do see uh, uh, the opportunities created by uh, this type of uh, 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 process, uh, especially at local levels, uh, based on, you know, my experience of you know, and uh, uh, Professor Chen Zhouhe, you know, uh, the co-directing this program, I do see there's a lot, a lot of potentials created at the same time. So globalization is something, I think, put in other words, probably there's still many unknown dimensions in the, the, the globalization process. And uh, uh, for people who, you know, in science, and for especially people who are in, in humanities, we need to um, uh, engage in the process and look for, you know, uh, or, you know, to, catch the well, that's opportunities. The, that's yes. the point you made. The engagement, um, direct engagement is vital if we yes. want to see this go in the proper direction. So um, I want to open it up to uh, all of you and uh, see if you can, uh, oh, if the, there you are, please. <laughs> Able 
through just an email and get a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I haven't had that chance. Oh, you haven't sent me an email. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> Are you suggesting that <laughs> President Simmons should be the party secretary? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I visited Chinua, uh, by the way, I met with the uh, party secretary. Uh, that, was the, that was the official that I actually met with because it turns out that the, 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 um, his academic counterpart was, was away. So that was very interesting. So how do you, how do you address that? Well, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's a complex question. And uh, I think that uh, uh, if we're asking that, that uh, should China adopt the same system of a search committee searching for the chancellor of a major university and uh, have the system work exactly like American universities, I would say the answer is no, because I think that, that, that uh, uh, you can't transplant the American experience in whole into an entirely different culture. Because I think that we, if we look at the experience of the Soviet uh, Union, I think that for a while it was really trying to westernize in a very radical kind of radical departure from the Soviet system before that. And the result was disastrous. So I think that that for a, a country the size of China, the government has to move very prudently on making changes. Because I think that, that, uh, that, that although it's not kind of usually we don't perceive things as such in a stable society, you thought everything is uh, so solid that uh, to make a society become uh, turbulent is impossible. That's the usual perception. It's not the case. I think that China, I have to say that the Chinese history for the last many, many years is, is that every time there is some particular ideology saying that let's make a drastic change and, and, and just, just push to the extreme of this, this ideology, the result is just very destructive. So I have to say that, that if I were the leaders of a country, I would have also to say that if we do anything, we have to move it and seeking consensus and balance the interests of the various parts. But on the whole, over the years, it's moving on a good trajectory. And, and actually, for the last seven and a half years, when I observed the Chinese scene, I have to say that I was very impressed with the leaders of the country, whether in the university or in the government. And actually, the higher you go, the wiser they, they, they appear to be, because you know that they all say the things that, uh, I mean, when you have a conversation with them, they all say things that uh, coming from a very reasonable and rational person. So uh, my overall feeling is, is, is that I think that uh, that the goal should be such that uh, I, I'm not just talking about the uh, this specific issue that you were talking about, the higher education and the running of a university. I would say that the goal is not to make the Chinese universities to be exactly like American universities. The goal is that to have the academic system, the reward and the demerit-based uh, competition uh, in research and the admission of students those should uh, take the American system into consideration and adopt the American systems uh, in those regards. But exactly how can we accomplish that? I think that's it's something that really, uh, actually, I don't think I'm actually qualified to make a comment on because I think that, 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 uh, 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 that just from my experience in the past few years, I know that 
even in university, it's extremely complex scene. You know that whether you, you you would step on the toe of somebody else, sometimes you do it unknowingly, and 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 you 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 will realize later on. So I think that 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 uh, in, in 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 this kind of situation, I think that one has to uh, trust the judgment of professionals who. Are uh, are managing the system, and and uh, so the, I think the short answer to summarize to your question is that I think that uh, that that if you look at the uh, success they have so far, I think that uh, it probably is safer to leave it in those hands instead of saying that let's do something radical. As for, as for me, I'll just say this, uh, you know. Um, as Professor Preparata said, you know, it is really something that faculty have total academic freedom. Imagine that concept, okay? Uh, but even though that is true in this country, we have every, uh, we have periodically uh, attacks 